to the panel discussion for the film Dolores. My name is Wendy Waxman Kern, and I am the 4 H program coordinator for San Juan County WSU Extension, and I will be your host for this event. Before we begin, I would like to share a land and labor acknowledgement and community commitments prepared collaboratively by the Ag Summit Steering Committee. We recognize and honor all peoples who have ancestral ties to these lands and waters. We recognize and honor our ancestors and all those living who have contributed their labor, experience, and knowledge to growing food and nourishing communities. It is our hope the summit, including this event, can offer a next building step in building relationships, educating, and creating space for the voices of Black, Indigenous and people of color that have been silenced, marginalized and excluded from local and larger food and agricultural conversations. With great gratitude, we welcome our panelists who will be sharing their knowledge, experience and wisdom with us today. Recognizing that we may have challenging conversations today, we invite you to participate in these community commitments while listening and participating in today's discussion and Q&A. We will actively listen and honor the experiences that others have lived. We will create a space that allows for learning and growth. If you are someone who speaks easily, move up into a listening role. If you listen easily, we encourage you to move up into a speaking role and ask questions. We will have grace with each other. We will acknowledge mistakes and commit to change. I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors and partners who help us to continue to offer the San Juan Islands Ag Summit year after year. And lastly, before I introduce today's facilitator, a few housekeeping items. This session will be recorded, so you may access it later. The chat is disabled for this webinar. We welcome you to add questions to the Q&A box as you think of them. We will do our best to get through and answer. You will receive an invitation to an evaluation of today's event at the end of the session. Please fill it out. Your input helps us create better programming. With that, it is my honor to introduce today's discussion facilitator, Lerner Limbach. Lerner is the general manager and co-founder of the Orcas Food Co-op. He is a fourth generation cooperator and is currently pursuing a master's degree in cooperative management. A 20 year resident of Orcas Island, Lerner has also served on the Agricultural Resources Committee of San Juan County since 2013 and as chair of the committee for five of those years. Lerner will introduce our panelists and start today's discussion with a few questions, and then we'll take as many audience questions as time will allow. With that, I pass it to you, Lerner. Thanks, Wendy. And just wanna express my gratitude to everybody who put this event together. Um, it's an honor to be here with you all today and to welcome our amazing panelists. Our first panelist, Dolores Huerta, is a labor leader and community organizer. She has worked for civil rights and social justice for over 50 years. In 1962, she and Cesar Chavez founded the United Farm Workers Union. She served as vice president and played a critical role in many of the union's accomplishments for four decades. In 2002, she received the Puffin Nation $100,000 prize for creative citizenship, which she used to establish the Dolores Huerta Foundation. The foundation is connecting groundbreaking community-based organizing to state and national movements to register and educate voters, advocate for education reform, bring about infrastructure improvements in low-income communities, advocate for greater equality for the LGBT community and create strong leadership development. She has received numerous awards, among them the Eleanor Roosevelt 
Human Rights Award from President Clinton in 1998. In 2012, President Obama bestowed Dolores with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian award in the United States. She has also received the 2021 USA Today Women of the Century Award and Glamour Magazine's Women of the Year Award. Our second panelist is Edgar Franks. Edgar Franks is the Washington State Campaign and Political Director for Familias Unidas por la Justicia, where he works with union leadership and allies in the development and implementation of the Just Transition Framework that centers food sovereignty and worker organizing in innovative models of participatory democracy, such as people's movement assemblies and tribunals. Edgar has strong farm worker roots in Skagit County, where he grew up. Edgar honed his organizing skills, supporting the formation of the first independent farm workers union in Washington state since 1986. As an organizer, he works in Whatcom and Skagit counties and sometimes travels to Eastern Washington to meet with farm workers as needed and supports their organizing efforts, working with union organizers of Familias Unidas por la Justicia. And with that, I'm gonna move into the first question. <clears throat> so I wanted to start off with uh, what are the local um, and regional issues you're working on? Uh, oh, actually, I'm sorry. Before I jump into the first question, I wanted to just ask you both to uh, take a few minutes and uh, give an overview of your, of your current work. Uh, before we move into the questions. Let's start with you, Dolores. Well, thank you. Well, we have uh, the Dolores Orta Foundation, which uh, I formed after I left the United Farm Workers. And uh, we are doing a lot of work. Uh, by, we've been doing a lot of COVID uh, relief right now. Uh, we've uh, raised money so that we could give resources to some of those families that were not eligible for other types of relief, well, many, of them, many of them undocumented of uh, workers. And of course, many of them are farm workers or the people that we work with. Uh, we actually are in four different counties in the Central Valley of California, uh, three of Fresno, Tulare, and Kern, and also in Los Angeles County up in the high desert. Uh, one of our chapters uh, has a big task of feeding the homeless people. They've sort of adopted a homeless camp and they make sure that they get hot food served to them. Uh, we're also uh, right now canvassing actually, uh, our, uh, their, they, our folks have got their masks on and they, you know, they've got the shields and the masks and they're going door to door and they're providing a re relief. I mean, information about what resources are available to people and also providing them the masks that they need uh, during this pandemic. We have a big youth group in all of our different areas and our youth group, they pretty much participate with what we do, but they also have their own uh, uh, youth development uh, lessons uh, that, they, that they receive. Uh, we're very active in the state legislature supporting a, a many, many uh, pieces of legislation uh, to help the people uh, that we serve. And um, we have a huge education program. We're active in about 17 different school districts. And basically, uh, trying to eliminate the school to prison pipeline, uh, fighting the discrimination uh, that we face in our schools. We sued our high school district uh, here in Bakersfield, California. And by the way, Bakersfield, California is the most conservative, conservative county in California. Uh, this is uh, the area that Kevin McCarthy, who was the Republican head of the House of Representatives, uh, he, this is where he's from. So, and this county is very embedded with racism uh, and the lawsuit that we filed against the Kern High School District was because of racism. They suspended, I mean, excuse me, they, they expelled, li literally kicked out of school over 2,000 uh, students that were black and brown. Uh, I would say about 95% of them were black and brown. And so uh, we sued them for implicit bias. Uh, they have, from the 2,000 that they expelled, we have <laughs> got that number down to 21, from 2,000 to 21. And uh, so we're still working on that because uh, some of the things that they were supposed to do, they still haven't done. We were, they were supposed to do a Black History Month and Hispanic Heritage Month. And of course they didn't do it. Oh, I, I forgot to mention that 70% of the students are 
students of ethnic backgrounds, the majority of them Latino, okay? So well, this is just an example of the uh, systemic racism that we're uh, trying to fight. But in the organizing, because we do grassroots organizing, uh, we tell folks when we, we organize them that number one, nothing is going to change unless they get involved Number two, they can't do it by themselves. You've got to have an organization to make it happen. Uh, we have to take direct nonviolent action to change things and that they can't ex expect anybody to come and do it for them, that they are the ones that have to get out there and make the changes and they do. And then of course, some of them get elected to school boards and recreation boards and city councils. And of course now with redistricting, we're very active in redistricting. So hopefully after the redist redistricting is over, we're gonna have many more of them that will be representing their communities where they live. And so this is our aim, it's about building political power, but doing it from the grassroots level. Thanks so much. Okay, Edgar, go ahead. All right. um, great to be here with everyone. Thank you for inviting and happy Passover. Um, so um, I think some of the regional work um, and some of the scope of work that we've been working on, um, it's kind of twofold, I think. Uh, some of it is policy, even though that's really not uh, our priority as a union. Um, you know, our focus has always been, um, you know, organizing workers. If there's no workers, there is no union. Um, and it's definitely needed, needed in Whatcom, Skagit, all over the area. So our primary focus right now is going out, um, talking to farm workers um, all over the county. Um, um, you know, obviously COVID is, is num priority number one, getting workers the equipment they need and everything to be safe um, in their housing and with their families, giving food out. Yes, last week we had a big um, event where we gave out like thousands of boxes of food to farm workers, um, as long also with rental assistance and masks and all that. Uh, we've been helping people register to, um, to get their vaccines. I actually have a vaccine appointment right after this. Um, so that's been our number one priority, the health and safety of workers. Um, our um, organizing, you know, we're really into organizing locally, but however, because there are so few organizations or unions that specifically uh, address the needs of farm workers. We've been asked to go outside of our, our area here in Western Washington. Um, we know for the majority of last year, we were in Yakima and the Yakima Valley supporting a series of strikes that were organized by processing, apple processing uh, workers um, where thousands of people were getting sick and hundreds unfortunately died uh, because the help was so so late in arriving. Um, um, you know, we also had the issues of H2A guest worker program uh, workers that were also not um, being protected. So we've been uh, part of a oversight committee in Washington state to change policies and really address, um, um, why, well, just figuring out why the H2A program has blown up so much in Washington state and it's causing um, you know, we're talking about the food system and labor. That's, you know, I think one of the big issues that we really need to investigate here in Washington state, um, this issue of the H2A workers um, and the power imbalance that exists there. Um, uh, so, yeah, we've been trying to work on all fronts. Uh, you know, obviously um, our priority is our local our community here in Skagit, Whatcom, San Juan Islands also. Um, but trying to figure out what can we do um, to cause those systemic changes that are needed. You know, as you read in the bio, we're committed to the just transition framework about envisioning a new food system because we know the food system that exists right now is not, is not good. It's, you know, it's causing climate change, exploits labor and resources, and that's not a path we can continue. Um, so, you know, part of that just transition also involved us getting into an area fairly recently into policy and decision making uh, with legislators in Olympia. So um, we've been helping with the Washington Strong Act with Rep Representative Lekanoff and Liz Lovelett, um, trying to get that through. Um, 
uh, the HEAL Act, which focuses and highlights environmental justice and policy making. Um, and also, again, um, shifting um, our attention to uh, farm workers, um, trying to pass overtime for Washington farm workers. Uh, hopefully, we'll get that bill signed in a couple of weeks. And um, uh, being on the H-2A Oversight Committee, uh, with working with the governor's office to, uh, again, um, really look into the solve the problems of the H-2A program here in Washington State, which hopefully can lead to something at the federal level. Hmm. That's actually a great segue. Um, my first question, uh, and thanks so much for the overview, um, had to do with what are the local and regional issues you're working on and how do they tie in with the broader struggles? Um, I'd be curious to hear more about the H2A for sure and how, how working on that locally ties in with the um, national efforts and um, yeah, anything else that you have to add about uh, local and regional issues you're working on, how they tie in with the broader struggles? Uh, am I, is that? Yeah, the, now um, it's a free for all, either one of you, yeah. <laughs> go, ahead, go ahead, Dolores. Thank you, well, uh, I agree with Edgar that the H2A program is really a negative. It really uh, negatively impacts on the wages of farm workers. It's really a slave program. And of course, that's one of the things that we're fighting right now is uh, racism because we know that that's, uh, that's uh, racism started with slavery. And unfortunately, the H2A program is what I consider a step up from slavery because the workers that don't have rights, they, they don't, they're not covered with social security. They don't get unemployment insurance, at least in the state of California where we have unemployment insurance. Uh, you know, they're not able to join a union and uh, they're captive. They're totally completely captive. And they're brought in basically to displace the local farm workers. And whenever H-2A workers are brought in, you know, the wages are, are dropped and, and the growers, of course, they prefer, they prefer to have their slaves rather than have the local farm workers. So it has a de devastating impact also on the local communities. So I'm happy to see that uh, Mr. Franks is actually working against this issue. I think it's a very, very important issue. And we know that under the Trump administration, uh, they brought in many, many more uh, H2A workers. And actually, when Hilda Solis, who was the first Latina to be on the uh, on Obama's cabinet, and before that, actually, when we passed the amnesty bill in 1986, uh, which legalized a lot of farm workers, and I always like to remind people that it was Senator Ted Kennedy who did the heavy lifting to get that bill passed, and I was working with Senator Kennedy uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, so we made it very uh, stri strict for them to bring in H-2A workers. The Trump administration diluted those protections for local workers. And so we have, now we're stuck with this and uh, hopefully uh, President Biden, we have a new Secretary of Labor now, as we know, and hopefully that we can uh, change that and bring it back to where it was before because the restrictions that we had put into the law were number one, they had to, uh, they had to, uh, they had to recruit local workers uh, workers had to be paid the same wages, uh, or to be uh, any H2A workers uh, would have to be paid the same wages as the local workers, and and they couldn't do this without going into the community to recruit local workers. What so meant radio ads, newspaper ads, and actually have local recruiters come out there because we know we have a lot of young, especially young people of color, uh, Latinos basically that are out of work. They don't have work, and agricultural work is a very dis. A, a dignified work. And we know the farm workers that put the food on our table every day. Yeah. And I think many of them are finally getting recognized as essential workers, at least in the state of California, they have not been recognized as essential workers. And I think even with the, uh, the uh, American Rescue Plan that was just passed, they are, they, are, they are recognized as essential workers because at least in California, they have been given priority in terms of the vaccinations, which we are also doing vaccine clinics uh, like Mr. Frank's is. So you know, that, that's a step forward. But I think we have to go a lot further. Uh, for instance, I, I was on a Zoom uh, this morning uh, with uh, people from Colorado who were celebrating such a Chavez Day. And uh, in Colorado, they have a farm worker bill that they're trying to pass now. And it really just gives farm workers the basic things like overtime pay, as Mr. Franks also, also mentioned, uh, the fact that they can't uh, reduce uh, their minimum wage or make it separately, and a lot of provisions that industrial workers have been given bene those benefits for 85 years. 
<laughs> since 1935 when they passed the National Labor Relations Act, you know? And, and you, but one would think, well, why does it, that it takes almost a hundred years for farm workers to be treated with respect and been given be, to be given the basic rights, you know? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until the farm workers got toilets in the fields uh, when the, we and the United Farm Workers went out on strike and did our boycotts and everything. But from the time I signed my first contract, my first collective bargaining agreement with toilets in 1966, then it didn't become a law until Jerry Brown got elected, I think 1970, did not become a national law until 1982. <laughs> Almost 20 years to get farm workers to, to have toilets, you know, and wow. so we know that we, but I think that in today's world, when things are moving much more rapidly, when people's attentions are not focused on racism, uh, when literally people have to be outed, uh, whether they're, they're racist or not, you know, and I think that the things are going to be moving a lot faster. So we're hoping hey. that the law in Colorado gets passed. It's now in the Senate, in the state of Colorado. Uh, to give farm workers these basic rights. Oh, I'm, I wanted to mention that in California now, well, we do have a Cesar Chavez Day, a holiday, it's a paid holiday. Uh, I have a recognition day for myself. And then our Filipino uh, vice president of the United Farm Workers, Larry Edeong, he also has a recognition day. But now they are considering a farm worker day. <laughs> and I think it's going to pass. I think our governor is going to pass, you know, sign it when it passes the legislature. And that will be good because that way it will just remind everybody that farm workers feed us. And, not, and the other thing is that the Farm Bureau is supporting it. And so now we see that, you know, once you get something into a law, the growers have to comply and then they do it because they have to. And now they say they don't mind it. <laughs> Dolores, could you, um, so there's been a lot of talk about H2A program, which is such an important topic right now. And I know there's a lot of people that um, probably are on this who haven't really heard of the HOA program. So would you mind just giving uh, just a quick, clear description of what the HOA program is and why is it, um, you know, why is it a negative thing? Is that for me or Mr. Franks? Oh, either, either one is fine. Um, if you, uh, you could answer it. Well, I, I can answer because, you know, when we started the United Farm Workers, that's one of the things that we were fighting for. And we were finally able to eliminate the H, uh, the Bracero program, as they call it then. Bracero means arms in Spanish. And we were finally able to eliminate the Bracero program in uh, 1962, or excuse me, 1963. And once we did that, then it was so much easier to organize the workers into a union. But it was very, very hard to do it while they had the Bracero program. And this is what the, it's a foreign worker program, so that you know, our government can bring in uh, foreign workers uh, from mostly they come from Mexico, but actually we had a lot of foreign workers that were brought into the state of Washington. And in fact, I think we filed a lot, the United Farm Workers, we filed a lawsuit because uh, they had uh, foreign workers that were, be, I think, being brought in from, from Th Thailand, if I remember correctly. And it was quite a scandal because these workers had to uh, borrow money to be able to come. And then they were kind of held in hostage and then they couldn't pay the money. They weren't being paid uh, any wages they, they could possibly catch up. And so they, this has been going on uh, since World War II, actually. That's when it started. Because when so many people were taken off to war in World War, War II, then they had to bring in people to, uh, to, again, to do the agricultural work. So it started, the program started, I think, in 1942 or 43 right after the war started. But then it kept going and going and going. Even after the war ended, they were still bringing in. Uh, so over the course of, and I think we finally, as I said, 1962, by that time they had brought in several million. And it got so bad. And I, you know, I worked on this program for so long to try to get rid of it. And I worked with a lot of the Braceros that they would, uh, growers would actually have a, a crew of workers and then they would rent them literally rent them to other growers. And they got fabulously rich because of back there, and it doesn't sound like a lot of money now, but every farmer uh, got money from the government to feed the workers. And so uh, I know you all know who the charges are. There's a really uh, a football team here in California. Uh, the, the, the owner of the charges, and I happen to know him because we grew up in the same town and I knew him when we were, when we were kids. He became fabulously wealthy, uh, you know, off of feeding the Braceros. 
because well, they got the money from the government to feed them, but then the kind of food that they gave them was not nutritious. And, and, it, and many of the workers suffered so much. So we, I had a lot of cases of those bus settles. The, the good thing that happened is after the program ended in 1962 or 63, I can't remember which year, but the, our government legalized a lot of the braceros, okay? So, and it kind of happened without any legislation. And there was no law that passed, just all of a sudden, all of the braceros were legalized, okay? So a lot of the families that we have right now, uh, like uh, Mexican, especially Mexican families, uh, were legalized during that period of time. Thank you. Um, so why don't we, I wanna see if Edgar has anything to add about uh, H2A and sort of how that ties in with the national um, issue and other, other local issues maybe. And then I have some other questions. No, no, I think, um, I mean, we're trying to, I think that legacy that Dolores Huerta and the UFW have left us of, you know, fighting these exploitative programs it's something that uh, we continue here in Washington State. Um, if y'all remember in Sumas, there was a huge farm here of like 2,000 acres of blueberries where workers were out working for like 12 hours a day under when it was like that wildfire in British Columbia. And just like workers were just falling and passing out. And unfortunately, one passed away. Um, but out of that, you know, came a lawsuit. Um, the farm was penalized. Um, and then that started also a series of strikes around the United um, uh, Washington State that we were involved in that all involved H2A workers from, um, you know, Kennewick to Mattawa and Quincy um, and all under, you know, the same things that uh, Dolores just mentioned. It's the same thing, you know, human trafficking from bringing workers from California to Washington, withholding passports if workers speak out. Um, they get blacklisted. Um, so, yeah, it, it, in essence, we are we're in agreement that it is a quasi slave program, le just legalized, um, and it's causing great harm to farm workers, um, both the ones that are getting brought in and the domestic workers that get displaced by the program. So, um, yeah, there, was, there was a lawsuit that was filed by one of the uh, public interest law firms there in Seattle uh, and they represented a group of workers in the Yakima Valley and uh, they, they had been uh, displaced by the uh, H2A workers and they won their lawsuit. And I, they invited me to uh, come and be there with them when they got their checks. So, <laughs> but that, that, that's very rare that that happens because you really uh, got to know workers that are knowledgeable. You've got to have a, a, a legal representation, people that will offer to represent them, but it happens a lot and that's why the growers would prefer to have, as I said before, would prefer to have slaves and pay them less, but they do uh, the, the local workers. So there's been a couple of questions typed in that are really uh, actually good, uh, um, tied in with what you're talking about. And so I wanna see if I can just ask those together. Um, so can you, um, one, can you describe a little more uh, the conditions right now of uh, the housing that farm workers have, um, you know, food, rest breaks, um, paid vacation, things like, things like that. And talk a little bit about that. And then um, how does that, how has that improved when they're covered uh, for farm workers who are part of a union? And then also how many, how many farm workers are uh, covered in a labor contract in Washington and California? Either one of you, whoever knows the answer. I know in Washington state that the United Farm Workers, of course, um, when I was still with the union, uh, we were able to get the wine companies up there. Um, I have to remember the name of the wine company, but that, uh, yeah, so we, they have uh, uh, contracts with the, one of the wine companies up there. And my understanding, the last time I was in Washington state, just before the pandemic, uh, they have a number of contracts with some of the dairies there. And so the United Farm Workers, I think they do still have organizers that are working in that area. So um, in terms of the housing conditions, uh, I think maybe uh, Mr. Franks can probably give a better description of that than I can because uh, I haven't been up there recently. In California, uh, obviously when farm workers have a, 
uh, a union contract, they make more money. They're going to get a pension plan when they retire from working. Of course, in the state of California, we also have unemployment insurance for farm workers. We also have the overtime uh, for farm workers also. So uh, one of the things that is now being considered in the legislature is that farm workers can choose their, oh, we have the agricultural labor relations law, which allows union to join a union. Uh, and a bill has been considered in the state legislature right now that is really going to help more workers uh, unionize is that, that they can choose their union with what they call a card check election. So instead of having to have a secret ballot election, which puts a lot of pressure on, on the workers, they can just choose their union with a signature. And if you consider that your signature is good enough to buy a house, buy a car, get married, get a divorce, <laughs> that it should be good enough to be able to choose your union. Awesome. Edgar? Yeah, um, I think the housing is still an issue in Washington um, uh, where we have our contract. Uh, we do have better housing than before. I know before a lot of workers are, were living in cramped conditions and you know mice in the mattresses and tin roofs and all that. This was just like a couple of years ago. It wasn't like a long time ago. It's still the dilapidated housing exists. Um, so, and we also have this issue about, again, the H2A program and the housing conditions they're currently in, where a lot of the outbreaks started happening in agriculture because of like packing people in into uh, small trailers or small cabins with no six feet separation, no ventilation, um, uh, no real enforcement on, on people that weren't enforcing the social distancing um, uh, guidelines from the CDC and the governor's orders. So the housing continues to be an issue, um, not only for H2A, but even local workers. Um, I mean, uh, just rent on itself is getting super high, um, even in areas in Skagit and Whatcom and rural areas, our rent is starting to go super high uh, while wages are still very low. Um, so that's another area of concern um, that we wanna really address the affordable housing crisis. Um, not just for farm workers, but everybody in our community. I mean, we've seen like homeless sweeps happening here in Bellingham for the last couple of weeks, which is sad to see. And farm workers are maybe a paycheck away from being out in the streets if um, you know wages and conditions don't improve. And um, so, you know, we want to take a you know we're we're a farm worker union, but I think we still want to you know contribute do our part to make sure everybody does well um, in addressing those, those issues um, because we're all part of the same community here. And do you know how many uh, farm workers and what portion of farm workers are, are covered by union contracts right oh. now? Yes, and oh, um, so the winery that's in the union, UFW contract, the Chateau St. Michel, um, and I believe in Sunnyside, I think is somewhere over there. Um, and uh, we have, uh, I think there are around 200 or 300 workers under contract. Uh, and our union has uh, 500 workers under contract. So, you know, if 700 total under contract and 100,000 workers that still need to be organized. So we, I mean, we used to consider that an opportunity for, for uh, organizing. Awesome. Um, there was a question about the Farm Workforce Modernization Act um, recently out. Yeah, I was going to say that in California, of course, there are many more hundreds of workers mm -hmm. that have union contracts, and uh, particularly in the vegetable industry, the strawberry industry. So yeah, but it sounds like it's a small percentage. Yeah, let, let me just say something yeah. though, yeah, and I think that uh, the agricultural community, and uh, I remember hearing the word partners a little while ago, I don't remember what context, but in, in this Zoom that we're doing, but the agricultural industry has, they are so hell bent that not to let their workers unionize, not realizing that the workers are their partners. I can say that when I was with the union and uh, I negotiated the contracts and many of the employers didn't realize that their workers are actually taking care of their property I remember one particular grower who didn't know that he was being ripped off by his uh, supervisors. 
And uh, when we sat down negotiations, the worker said to him, look, you don't realize that one of your managers of your ranch is actually taking uh, equipment and material off of your property to start his own company, you know? So the workers, the farm workers, they care about the land, they care about the crops, and they're there to protect the employer also. And so again, when we talk about racism, if we can eliminate that racism so that employers can see their workers as human beings, if they can see their workers as equals, if they can see their workers as partners and take away that opposition that they have to partnering with their workers, let them form a, a, a union. A union is an organization. The employers have their organizations. They belong to Western Growers. They belong to the Farm Bureau Federation. Um, somebody's knocking on my door. <laughs> Hold on just a second. Uh, All right. Anyway, uh, so, uh, you know, they, they don't realize that, that uh, if they can get away from that mindset and, and it comes down to slavery because they have that racism against the workers because most of the workers are uh, uh, brown or black or Asian. If they can just get away with that and say, okay, we're going to be equal. We're going to be equal with our workers, you know, yeah. I mean, good, it, 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 treat them as equals and, and not as, as uh, people that are lesser than they are. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're here. So um, yeah. Um, Edgar, any follow up to that? And then, and then specifically, you know, thoughts on the workforce modernization act. Oh yeah. We're all curious about your, your thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I think there still needs to be a lot of work around the, the relationship between employers and workers. Um, I think uh, we're um, considered a threat when workers organize, even though it's for the well-being of the employer. You know, you want healthy workers and, you know, workers just want their, their fair share. You know, sometimes it's, you know, even something as basic as a clean bathroom, you know, nothing, something that's really, you know, uh, not super revolutionary or anything. People just want to be treated with dignity. Um, um, so it's in the benefit, you know, to work with your workers, um, you know, and don't consider them a threat or else that conflict is going to always be existing. You're just going to be paranoid for forever. Um, um, about the Farm Workforce Modernization Act, um, our union has actually come out um, opposing because of two major components to it. One is the mandatory use of E-Verify um, throughout of all agriculture, which we believe uh, will set a bad precedent um, for future legislation uh, regarding, you know, if there's a comprehensive immigration reform package put together that um, E-Verify, uh, which is, a, you know, it's a program uh, where employers can opt in right now to verify status for workers, um, whether that papers or not, uh, which would have a tremendous impact on, you know, workers that are undocumented, which is no secret, it, lots of workers in agriculture are undocumented. So it would, um, you know, they would find themselves unemployed all of a sudden. Um, and another is the, uh, again, the expansion of the H-2A program um, within the Farm Workforce Modernization Act. Um, this bill was written by Dan Newhouse, who's a super conservative um, uh, grower, who's also our state representative in the Yakima area. And he uh, personally benef would benefit from an H-2A program and more streamlining, you know. We already mentioned there's a lot of uh, power imbalances within the H-2A program and believe that this would only be another uh, challenge for farm workers going down the line. So those are uh, our opposition to the Farm Workforce Modernization Act. Um, you know, we believe that workers should just get amnesty just flat out uh, because of everything they've done throughout the pandemic and beyond. Um, so, you know, I think that those are the thoughts from, from our union here. Well, actually, uh, that's right on point right now because there is an Immigration Reform Act right now uh, that has already been presented in the Congress. And uh, we know that in Washington State and California, we have uh, great representatives that are going to vote for this. But we know that the, in the other states, especially in the South and the Midwest, we're going to have to put a lot of pressure uh, to try to get this bill passed. And it will give the farm workers, uh, uh, Senator Feinstein from California, 
has had a bill now uh, to, in order to give the farm workers, uh, in, all farm workers will be treated specially and they would uh, be given their legal status. So, but it's going to take, I think, a lot of work on all of our parts to contact people in other states, you know. And I know Washington State is right next to uh, Idaho, you know, here in, in California, we're right next to Nevada. Uh, and uh, we have to reach over to Arizona and make sure that, we, and I think Arizona, we have two good senators now there too. Um, one of them is kind of waffling on, on the filibuster, but uh, uh, Mark Kelly, I think, would vote uh, actually to, uh, to give uh, for that law. But we have to work to really uh, maybe make sure that we get all of the Democrats to vote for it. Because as we know, the Senate is evenly divided right now, you know, with, with Democrats and Republicans. I know our, our Kamala Harris, our vice president, will definitely vote for it. But so I, I just say to everybody, like folks are in Washington State, if you have friends or relatives in Idaho, uh, please call them, you know, and tell them to contact their senators. And we've got to do, a ma I think, a massive, massive uh, campaign uh, to get immigration reform uh, approved. We know it's, and I just like to remind everybody, you know, when we talk about immigrants coming to the United States, that the first immigrants were from, from Europe. I mean, when we talk about immigrants, <laughs> they were not asked to show any kind of a green card and there was no border patrol, uh, you know, at the Atlantic Ocean to prevent them from getting in. So we just have to remember that. And, uh, and when we talk about legalization and citizenship for immigrants, as all of our Euro European immigrants know that it, it, you know, they benefited from this and so we have to constantly remind people, and I think that also helps us to get rid of racism, yeah. that this was a brown country when the immigrants from Europe arrived here. And we welcomed you, <laughs> we welcomed you. <laughs> and so now we've uh, got to, you know, say we've got to welcome the other immigrants that are coming here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, really quick, I just want to do a time check. It's 3.40 um, and there are some other questions typed in the chat. I'm gonna to try to get through um, uh, the other question prompts that I have, and then we'll see if we have more time for questions. But I think that questions that are typed in the, the uh, Q&A as well, um, we can probably uh, send the answers out later. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there as an idea. Um, but next I wanted to ask, um, what would success look like for you? And you know, specifically, what are some strategies um, that you're currently using or, or want to use to get to success? Um, and uh, why, don't we, why don't we start with Edgar? Um, well, I think how success looks like for us is to give workers uh, different pathways um, out of, you know, generational poverty and exploitation. Um, uh, whether it be, you know, through, you know, legislation and policy, and that's one way, uh, union contracts and, um, you know, worker representation, um, that's another way. But I think one of the ones that we're really focusing on and want to build off of is, you know, what would it look like if farms were run by workers, um, if they had access to capital and land and, you know, all those things you need to set up a farm. Um, and which, we, and we believe that workers, because of the history, um, you know, we're people of the land, um, um, and in our union, um, almost 100% are people um, from indigenous communities from Mexico and, and Guerrero that have sown the land for thousands and thousands of years for generations. However, when they cross the border, you know, they're put into these conditions where, you know, they have to work and hustle and, you know, work themselves to the bone to barely scrape by with no land or anything. Um, so we believe because of those experiences and the knowledge that farm workers possess, that they also have the skills and knowledge to build sustainable farms free from exploitation, whether from pesticides or abusive bosses. So that's one of our visions for our union to create these paths so workers can someday, you know, have that opportunity to have their own farms and, you know, talking about just transition, you know, transition away from industrial, big corporate agriculture to communal 
self-sustaining and food sovereignty minded principles. Um, and I think we can do it because we're already doing it here in Whatcom County with um, a, a this small farm worker cooperative called um, Tierra y Libertad, which has been operating for now five years, barely. Um, you know, we still have to pay off all the acres, but and, you know, it's there and it's serving as a model. Um, so I think that's the vision, I think, to someday transition um, agriculture in those ways to give the means to, to workers to, you know, to be well, not to be super rich and, you know, whatever, um, but just to be well, I think that's more important. Awesome, thank you. Dolores. Well, I, I love that vision. I think it would be wonderful if we could get back to the idea of the family farm and get away from agribusiness. If we could have organic farming everywhere so that we could stop the use of uh, these economic poisons that are put on our food. And I think some of this can be accomplished actually through legislation. And I, I'm a big believer in democracy. And I do believe that ultimately uh, whatever we want to happen has to be put in the form of a law. Uh, it has to have, we have to have legislation so that can be implemented where people can be held accountable, uh, you know. So, uh, and I, I'm, I just wanna say, I'm so happy that you're working up there in the Yakima Valley because there I think with a big, I've always wanted to go back to the Yakima Valley just to do a big voter registration drive there. I know there's a lot of great leadership in that area, uh, but it's time that they get a representative from the Yakima Valley that looks like them. I think on redistricting, which we, is another thing that uh, we are working on here uh, with my foundation, uh, we're very, very involved in redistricting uh, to make sure that people get the representation that not only looks like them, but that has the same values as they have. And so I think, uh, my, so my, my, uh, the way that we're gonna change a lot of the issues that are facing us, and not only for farm workers, but uh, just for uh, people of color, you know, is that we've got to erase the inequities that exist in our society. And uh, we have to do it through legislation. I, there's some pieces of legislation that are in the Congress right now that are besides the Immigration Reform Act, uh, we also have uh, uh, the, uh, uh, P the For the People Act. And again, sometimes on the West Coast, we get a little spoiled. Uh, because, you know, we do have such, such great representation in our legislatures and in our Congress, but, you know, we know we have these other states. Uh, for the People Act, by the way, is, is uh, to prevent the voter suppression that has been going on and also to get the money out of politics so we can pu uh, have public uh, campaign financing and so that people uh, that look like Edgar can run, can run for, for office. You don't have to be a millionaire to, uh, to run uh, for a public or political office. And so that's going to be really important. Uh, the other thing is a woman. I have to say that we have to fight for women's equality. So there's another bill that I'm uh, really uh, t asking everybody to support, and that's the Equal Rights Amendment for Women. And uh, we can make history in 2021 you know, last year we celebrated the fact that women got the right to vote, but in 2021, we can actually celebrate the fact that we can get into the Constitution of the United States, the Equal Rights Amendment. The United States is only one of the few countries in the world that has not uh, ratified the Equal Rights Amendment. It's also in the U.S. Senate. So we have a lot going on in the U.S. Senate. And again, I want to encourage everybody, call your friends, call your relatives in the other states and ask them to call their senators to support immigration reform uh, for the People Act too, so that we can make sure that all of these state legislatures that are passing laws uh, to keep people from voting, especially people of color, and of course, the Equal Rights Amendment. And if I could, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Limbaugh, Limbach, uh, if I could uh, give the website for the Equal Rights Amendment so everybody can write it down if they want to get one. Yeah. It's very simple. It's ERA, yes, 2021.org. ERA, YES, 2021.org. Thank you so much. Yes. Thanks for mentioning that. Um, I totally agree. Um, uh, thanks so much for all those solutions and um, sharing that with us because I think that um, it's a lot of times easy to focus on the negative and um, so one of the things we wanted to do is just really have some positive you know there's actually a lot of positive stuff happening um, and real ways to make change um, so 
uh, we only have about 10 minutes left. And so I, I wanted to wrap up sort of by just uh, having you elaborate a little bit on how other ways that people can get involved and, you know, what would you like to leave the participants with today? And, um, you know, how can people get involved with, uh, you know, what you're working on? Uh, yeah. Oh, well, let's, we can just do Dolores and then we'll go back to Edgar. Okay. Well, uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, all of us have to become uh, uh, missionaries. Uh, we all have to become healers. You know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that racism is a sickness. And we know that people uh, are being outed uh, because they're racist. And people have to take a position. Uh, you're racist or you're not a racist. And those of us that say, well, we're not racist, but it's not enough to be not a racist. We have to be anti-racism, okay? Because this is something that the cancer that we have in our United States that started again with slavery and against the indigenous people, against you know the African slaves that were brought here. And we know that we have to get rid of this because it has been so hurtful, not only to farm workers, but to all communities of color. And so we just have to say enough is enough. It's time to get over it. And we've got to look at all of our institutions, uh, public and private corporations. Everybody has to dig in right now and you know, declare themselves to be anti-racist and start doing something about the healing. You know, we have to be the healers. Like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, racism is a sickness and we have to be the healers. And so I just want to ask everybody to do whatever we can within our power to make sure that we are end racism in our school systems. In California, they just voted to have ethnic studies in every single high school as a mandatory requirement. And we've got to get that down into our elementary schools from kindergarten because kids are not born racist. They're made racist by the culture that they grow up in or, 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 the, or their parents. And so we have to stop this. So we have to have ethnic studies in kindergarten. We have to have women's studies so that little boys will know that little girls are equal to them. Maybe not in physical strength, but definitely in intelligence and we can stop the abuse against women, okay? Uh, labor studies, so people will know what labor unions are, you know, that they can understand why workers, because labor unions are workers organizing in their own organization to represent them, just like the employers have their own organizations, okay? And, and, and also civic studies, I think so. And in civic studies, so people understand the importance why everybody has to be a voter and why we have to elect progressive people uh, that have good values uh, to be our representatives. And then one other thing I just wanna throw in there, when I talk about women's studies, I also wanna talk about gender studies. And so the discrimination against our LGBTQ community uh, can also be ended because uh, these are, these are uh, the opposition that is keeping us from going forward. They're using women's reproductive rights, the right to abortion, using gay rights as a as, as way to divide us, to divide people. And we have to say, hey, those are, you know, if someone is LGBTQ, we have no business about who they love with or who they marry. It doesn't affect your family, right? The same thing with women's right to abortion. You know, that doesn't affect your family at all. And there's a, a great Mexican president, his name was Benito Juarez, and he had a statement that I like to share when people are kind of confused on these issues. And his saying was, respecting other people's rights is peace. You know, what a woman does with her body is her human right. If somebody wants to marry somebody of their own sex, that is their human right. So let's just remember that. So, and share that conversation with us. One other thing, remember this, let's only use the word race when it's attached to human, human race. Otherwise there are ethnic groups because we are all one human race. We are homo sapiens and our human race began in Africa. Human civilization began in Africa. So we are all Africans. Share that too at the dinner table, okay? <laughs> Let's see what the reactions are. But yes, we all have to take individual responsibility. You know, as Robert Kennedy said, just before he was assassinated, he said, you know, we have obligations and responsibilities to our fellow citizens. So all of us have to take that seriously. You know, we're gonna save our planet from global warming. We've got to get out there and we've got to advocate 
you know, we've got to advocate that we can make it happen. Si se puede. Mm. All right, Edgar, what do you, what would you like to leave us all with? And um, yeah, well, uh, how can people get involved? Yeah, uh, well, I wanted to first pay my respects to Dolores Huerta and all the work, you know, they did building the union and, um, you know, giving us a, you know, a, a chance to fight, a, a blueprint to fight back. Um, so I'm forever grateful for that. And all the things you just mentioned um, are all because of worker organizing and the tradition of the UFW. Um, so I first wanted to say that. Um, honor to be here, um, sharing space. Um, so I think um, um, some of the things that we encourage people to do is that wherever you are, there's always farm workers um, nearby. Um, and wherever there's farm workers, there's usually people that are out there helping them. So we need to support community-based organizations that are working with farm workers, um, you know, providing mutual aid or, um, you know, any kind of support to farm workers, I think is, is very important. Um, you know, obviously contacting your legislators and senators is really important. You know, if you want to help us out, we are on the battle for overtime right now here in Washington state. So you can call right now the, your local house of representative um, uh, person, congressperson, um, to help us pass that here in Washington state. Um, it just uh, passed the Labor and Commerce Committee uh, here in Washington for overtime for farm workers. Um, and again, I think come up with legislation or pathways or just community organizing models that um, benefit everybody, whether you be the farm, the small farmer, the worker, um, the grocer, um, you know, really start envisioning what a, a communal, regional food system looks like. I think that's really, you know, we really emphasize local, um, local, uh, everything, participatory democracy at a local level where everyone has a voice, whether you have papers or not. Um, I think that's um, um, where we want to really um, focus a lot of our attention to on top of farm work or organizing, you know, working with allies and community to come up with these solutions. Um, so, and using everything that we have at our disposal, um, you know, there's a lot of smart people out there that sometimes aren't giving, given the space and the chance, but, you know, hopefully, uh, when we recognize them, we give them chances to speak up and we listen to them um, because after all the people with uh, those experiences are the ones that are going to come up with uh, the solutions. So, yeah, I think that. Yeah. And I would just like to add that if, uh, if people want to learn more about the work of the Dolores Huerta Foundation, uh, we're at DoloresHuerta.org. It's really easy to find us. And if they would like to support uh, and become a part of our social justice movement, uh, they can just uh, uh, put in jointhf.org, jointhf.org. And if people want to support us, and also I'm sure Mr. Frank's organization, but if they want to support the Dolores Huerta Foundation, you can do it at... Uh, GIVE2DHF.org. And I'll put, I'll, I'll, okay. That's awesome. Thank you. And um, what yep. I can, DHF.org. Mm -hmm. What I can do is um, I'll connect with uh, both of you. Just make sure that uh, we can uh, maybe include some of that information in a follow up. I'm not exactly sure what we can do, but I know we have everybody's email address who's on this. And um, so I'll, I'll see if we can get a follow up out there with a, a list of links. Um, uh, yeah, so we're two minutes to four, so I'm just going to close it out. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm really excited to get more involved, um, you know, with both of you and, and follow up and, um, Edgar, you know, we're right across the water. Um, a couple of years ago, I just wanted to share that I, you know, participated in the, uh, Farm Workers March for, for Dignity that, uh, and that's where I first met Edgar and, um, that was just a really incredibly powerful experience and, um, um, and opened my eyes a lot. And, and so, um, yeah, I just wanted to, you know, encourage, I think any opportunities that, that we have when we're, you know, if we're invited to come participate, um, from personal experience, I found that really powerful. Um, and Dolores, March again. 
yeah, one day we'll be able to to march again. I look forward. I look forward to that. Um, and Dolores, uh, it was so special just having you here, and you look great, and it's just such an inspiration. Um, I'm definitely gonna carry this day with me, you know, going forward, and um, just thank you for making the time and just keeping on uh, fighting and spreading the message. Um, and uh, yeah, so thank oh, you. I'm kind of excited to learn about your work too, because um, you said co co cooperative management. I know, I don't know if that applies to agriculture, but I think it, it could also apply yeah. to nonprofit organizations. Okay. So it and, does. Yeah, so yeah. I would love it if you could put like your number in the chat or so uh, we can definitely reach out to you because our organization has grown so big. And, you know, when you grow really big, then you, you have, a, you need a lot of work to make sure that, yeah. the, that the ship is a, uh, staying afloat, okay? So I wanna thank you very much for inviting me. And I just wanna remind everybody that uh, the way that we say to people that you've got the power, right? And so we say, who's got the power? You've got the power. What kind of power? People power, all right? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much for having me. And thank you, Edgar, also for your work that you're doing with farm workers. Yeah. Thank you. Well, definitely, I'll definitely stay in touch. All right. Thank you. Um, and we're just going to, we'll, we'll call it there and um, I'll see you guys soon. And also, we want to thank everybody to put this together. Okay. And yeah. we'll put this together in, in the physical world. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Bye.